treatment the same? They are completely different. So, uh, like I mentioned before, I think uh, we should at least when somebody has been diagnosed with dry or being, is being treated with dry, uh, the diagnosis of dry eye disease should be qualified by whether they have evaporative or aqueous tear deficiency. Uh, I find this there are a lot of patients who have been on treatment for dry eye disease don't know. Uh, they don't. Uh, they have never been explained the difference, and this is problematic uh, because uh, you know um, the underlying cause is not addressed. And uh, if it is treated in the same way, you cannot give the patients, uh, you know, the, uh, the the precise treatment that is required or customize it based on the underlying problem. And therefore, most of them are unsatisfied uh, because they are getting a generalized treatment for uh, dry eye in general, which, you know, doesn't mean anything unless you know what is causing the dry eye. So for somebody who has evaporative dry eye, the treatment is targeted at the eyelids and the meibomian glands. So there are certain forms of treatments that uh, can help uh, reset the meibomian glands or, uh, you know, make them completely functional again. There are certain things that you can do yourself that are easier uh, and uh, helps with uh, the meibomian glands functioning normally. So the most common thing that and most easiest thing that you can do is blinking because that is, like I said, the the thing that started the problem in the first place, lesser blinking because of screen exposure. It's of course very difficult to ask somebody to blink more because it's like asking someone to breathe more because blinking is involuntary. But you can take blinking breaks, which are very helpful. So somebody who spends a lot of time on a system or on a screen can remember to take blinking breaks, maybe one in half an hour or so, just close your eyes for a few seconds and then blink 15, 20 times. That in itself is makes a huge difference. You can also do something called strategic blinking which basically means when you start getting symptoms uh, or you spent a day binge watching uh, OTTs or uh, you know, you've worked on a presentation or you've been traveling, you've been in air conditioned environment for a long time. And uh, typically, you know, these are triggers that will make you very symptomatic the next day. This is typically what happens to patients with evaporative dry eyes. And then uh, to prevent that, you can end the day by just doing uh, blinking exercises or even doing warm compresses with blinking. So warm compresses essentially are just transferring some amount of heat to your uh, eyelids. Uh, you can either do it wet uh, with a cloth or you can, you know, nowadays you have these microwavable pads that you can put on the eyelids. So that helps. So the treatment, this is the treatment for evaporative dry eye and then you have adjunctive or supplementary treatment with uh, lubricants or artificial tears. Whereas for aqueous deficiency dry, it's completely different. Uh, the underlying disease needs to be diagnosed. That needs to be treated. So a systemic treatment is in, uh, necessary. Anti-inflammatories play a very big role uh, uh, in uh, aqueous tear deficiency. Many patients would also require certain surgical procedures to correct other problems that they have, which can give them systemic uh, relief. So again, um, in terms of, not just in terms of the cause, but in, term, in terms of the treatment also, the treatment of evaporative dry eye and aqueous deficiency is completely different. The only thing common is the use of lubricants, which are for symptomatic relief, but they are not uh, targeted towards the disease pathology. And and the lubricants for both are the same because often people, you know, lubricants are available in uh, you know OTC, right, from a chemist directly. So people often kind of uh, start with that. Uh, so is that the same for both types of uh, uh, dry eyes? They are actually not the same, but there's a very subtle difference. So you can broadly classify the over-the-counter lubricants. In fact, all lubricants are over-the-counter. Right. Two, uh, two uh, types. The first type essentially are the ones which are less viscous. Hmm. Uh, uh, this is typically uh, a carboxymethyl cellulose eye drop, which is 0.5%. Uh, we prescribe this for patients with aqueous tear deficiency because they need eye drops more frequently and this is lighter and better tolerated. And then you have the more viscous lubricants, which are either hyaluronic acid or hydroxypropyl uh, methyl cellulose, HPMC, or something called polyethyl glycon uh, or PEG. Uh, these are more vis viscous and these are more retentive. So it's better to use them in evaporative dry eye where you're trying to retain the um, tears for a longer period of time. There's no ac actual deficiency, but just the evaporation is 
uh, faster and therefore leading to symptoms. So actually it is different. Uh, however, this difference is subtle. So a lot of times uh, people are using more the more viscous lubricants uh, when patients have aqueous deficiency or using the less viscous lubricants when they have evaporative, which is also not correct. Right. Um, and and a couple of questions that have come, I think somebody's asked if icing helps. I guess you said warm compressors, but somebody's actually asked about icing. Again, uh, you know, warm compressors will help uh, if you have evaporative. Icing will help if you have aqueous tear deficiency because icing essentially causes vasoconstriction. Uh, it causes the blood vessels to uh, shrink. And therefore, if you have an underlying inflammatory cause, then you know if you apply ice, then it reduces the pain, the discomfort, it makes you feel better. But if you use ice, if you have evaporative dry eye, and if you're using ice, it will block your myomimin glands even more and it will worsen your symptoms. So again, it depends on what kind of dry eye you have. So if you have inflammatory dry eye, which is aqueous tear deficiency, icing definitely helps. In fact, in some patients, we also advise them to keep their eye drops in the fridge and use it uh, you know, slightly cold at four degrees so that they have the additional comfort of, uh, uh, you know, the anti-inflammatory effect of using something cold. But if you have evaporative and if you're using something cold, it will, it can make things worse. Right. Um, and somebody's asked, can diet or increase in intake of water help? Not really. So what makes tears from your eyes is tears are uh, essentially filtered from the five and a half, six liters of blood that is flowing through our veins. Okay. So if you drink more water, it does not mean that your blood volume increases or that your wetness in the eyes can increase. That's actually not true. Um, uh, but, uh, uh, you know, in so drinking excessive water does not help. Having a good diet absolutely helps. It helps with everything. So if you have a healthy lifestyle, if you um, indulge in a healthy amount of physical activity, uh, if you have a very balanced diet, that helps with everything, you know, because the eye is not separated from the body and therefore your likelihood of developing autoimmune diseases or other problems that can make your dry eyes worse are much less if you are overall healthy. So yes, being healthy definitely helps with everything. Right. So um, in talking of a couple of those other things, uh, lifestyle related, um, does sleep play a role at all in any of the dry eyes? Um, yeah, let's talk of sleep first. Sleeping well does help. Um, if somebody is sleep deprived, that means your overall, your body is stressed. And if your body is stressed, then in that state, anything uh, that is causing uh, problems in the body, it just becomes worse. Okay, so sleep, not directly in terms of how long your eyes are closed, but in terms of the stress it induces in general in the body because you are sleep deprived or you're not rested enough. That can, if you have dry eyes, it can make it worse. Okay, 